This is Jim Hughes with another episode of Afio Now. I have a very special guest for you today. He's a good friend and former colleague. His name is Doug London. Uh, Doug spent 35 years as a CIA um, operations officer, serving primarily in the Near East, South Asia, Central Asia, and Africa. He was a chief of base and a complex zone. He was a chief of station three times. And he served in CIA's Counterterrorism Center, Information Operations Center, and the Vaunted Near East and South Asia Division. Uh, he is currently an adjunct professor at uh, Georgetown University and a non-resident fellow at the Middle East Institute. Doug, welcome to AFIO Now. Uh, thank you so much for having me on the program, Jim. Um, I, I, I have to confess I'm a little intimidated uh, because what the audience may not know is you are one of my first bosses ever. Uh, and were a uh, mentor to me throughout my career. So um, I can certainly blame any of my mistakes on you, but also attribute anything I did right to your tremendous guidance over the years. Well, as you know, the rule of thumb is the, uh, the boss takes the mistakes and the employee gets the credit, right? <laughs> as it should be. Yeah. Excellent. Doug, you got a new book coming out at the end of the month. What's it about and why did you write it? Yeah, the the recruiter um, spying on the lost out of American intelligence began really as a, a cathartic journey at the end of my career. I'd always wanted to write. I enjoyed writing. And um, when my career came to an end, uh, and it was a tough final couple of years working um, under the Trump administration at the time, I, I wanted to find a way to sort of, you know, work my way through some of the politicalization that I saw of the intelligence community that I, I found troubling. And and it all started really with the idea of the, the actual terminology of spying. And when I came in to the agency in the 80s, uh, inspired by folks like yourself and some of uh, the icons of, of our time, they still are to me, um, the idea of spying was a noble enterprise, uh, was something that the good folks did to protect other good folks. And the years, uh, at least since 9-11 and certainly through the, the, the recent times, uh, really seem to tank the idea of spying. I, in fact, asked my students recently, I teach at Georgetown, and I teach a class right now on human intelligence operations. And I said, you know, honestly, when you hear the word spy, what's your reaction? Is it positive or negative? And, and in fact, not to my surprise, most of the students had sort of an instinctive negative reaction. So I started writing what I thought was going to be a novel because I was concerned about protecting sources and methods, but I wanted to convey certain thoughts or themes and what I had seen happen to the intel community and, and specifically CIA um, after 9-11 and up through my departure in 2019. But I found myself sort of turning to anecdote after anecdote uh, that to me sort of illustrated how things had changed from before 9-11, the 17 or so years I served prior and, and including the Cold War to after 9-11. Really the, the change in the culture, the change in the atmosphere at the agency, which I believe took away from its primary role to really be the first uh, often best and last line of defense for American security. And as I wrote these anecdotes, I started to think, is there a way I could transform them in a way that at least the agency would approve and that wouldn't compromise any of the secrets and particularly the, the colleagues or the sources that I had been involved with. And I, and, I, and I found a way to do it that I thought showed what's so important about human intelligence operations, the realities of the people involved, the very human dynamic to human intelligence that had been somewhat uh, dismissed and relegated to a lower priority at, at our expense. And the consequences for the agency in doing the job that I believed it was set up to do. So it started sort of as a cathartic journey and maybe as a novel and turned actually into a nonfiction account. Doug, you point out that um, CIA went through a lot of changes, particularly uh, after 9-11. Can you give us uh, some examples of those and describe uh, why you think some of those changes occurred? The, the most obvious and impactful change I found uh, that would impact the culture of the agency, and particularly the clandestine service, the director of operations, was a, a more hierarchical, more military approach to interactions 
between senior officers and junior officers and, and the workforce writ large. I, I never remember uh, prior to 9-11 anybody referring to a senior officer really as, as sir. It was not that it was informal, but even when I worked for you uh, on, on numerous occasions, it was always Jim and Doug. And, and I think it lent to an atmosphere where you were comfortable hearing what I had to say, even if it might diverge from the, the standard assumptions or key assumptions. And I felt comfortable expressing opinions, particularly when it came to the the mechanics of espionage and mechanics of how we operated and, and how we would achieve our goals. That changed after 9-11. The, the, the agency overall, the DO in particular, became much more a place where conformity, conformists were rewarded over creativity and there was a real reluctance, in fact, a self-censorship among officers to, if you would, to use the buzzword, speak truth to power because it became a lot more cliquish and, and a lot more um, military in terms of how you in engage your chain of command. I found, in fact, senior officers, and, and of course, Jim, you were, it's now called a center chief, but a division chief, you always had an open door, as did officers of your era. Uh, because for one thing, you wanted to nurture the, the junior generation, but you also wanted to have an eye on what was going on and what you were missing, or at least that was the sense I got when I walked into your office or you know, one, any of the other icons of whom we speak. These days, the, the senior officers uh, really kind of confine themselves to a very tight inner circle. They don't really interact as much among the greater workforce. They might have the occasional town meeting, a very large kind of broad group, but they, they don't have interaction. And you can say that some of that is due to size. I mean, the agency is a bigger place. The DO is certainly larger than what it was in, in, in our day. Uh, or my day growing up at least, but it comes into an attitude in terms of that sort of the emperor is, is not wearing any clothes. You dare not say that to him because that could affect your career. That could affect your opportunities. And I think that really had the most damaging effect on the culture. And, and, and I saw what grew from that was a selection of those who were more the conformists, more willing to, say what senior officers wanted to hear, that they sort of started to replicate themselves and had sort of a, a generational effect on agency and agency leadership. That in turn seemed to then have the consequence of a <clears throat> risk calculus, which was less about operations and people and putting people at risk and more about a political risk calculus. I tend to think having lived through 9-11 as you did as well inside the agency, that some of that really was uh, given room to grow <clears throat> because there was definitely a belief in an existential threat to the agency. Uh, coming out of 9-11, people wanted accountability. They wanted somebody's head. They wanted someone to blame for 2,977 dead Americans and an attack of this magnitude on our soil. So it was natural to shout out intelligence failure. And, and to some aspects, I, I think it's fair to say there were intelligence failures. There were a lot of other failures in terms of policy and such like that. But the agency saw itself threatened by DOD. Uh, Secretary Rumsfeld <clears throat> made clear he was not really a great fan of CIA. And he certainly felt embarrassed, I believe, as, as, as one can see in reflections of his own comments, that the agency was able to muster a plan for Afghanistan, getting a team under Gary Sharon on the ground within 15 days of 9-11, where DOD simply couldn't do that for, uh, for a number of reasons. I think there was concern that FBI <clears throat> would perhaps also swallow the agency, or at least its mission. And so to sort of market what it felt it could sell to retain its survival, particularly to the political powers at the time and, and the White House, was what we do, which is unique, which is largely covert action. Uh, that, while the technically CIA isn't the only agency that can conduct covert action, the president can ask another agency. It's it's almost always been the CIA by virtue of authorities, by virtue of other considerations. And the agency came up with solutions to very difficult political challenges for that White House, the Bush White House, and its successor in terms of the Obama White House, in terms of what do you do with all these detainees that are being picked up on the ground? How can we uh, attack Al-Qaeda in Pakistan?
a sovereign state uh, with whom we're not at war, and started to embark on programs that were within CIA's charter, certainly within its authorities, but might not have been in the agency's best interest, nor even the United States' best interest over the long run in terms of second and third order consequences. And what it certainly did was detract from the investment in traditional intelligence collection, uh, particularly human intelligence collection. And you had then a generational expanse of different career fields, uh, the targeters particularly. Targeters became a big occupational field for the agency, the DO. They had a great deal to do with very successfully placing on the X, if you would, by geolocating potential targets, either you know, for the whole find, fix, and finish approach to uh, addressing counterterrorist threats. And those type of uh, career fields have sort of less investment in human, less investment, particularly in the agents themselves. And I think that confluence of dynamics allowed the agency to see some of its human capability atrophy and and promoted those who were more focused on counter uh, uh, covert action for counterterrorism and counterterrorism itself and a much more paramilitary chemistry and feeling inside the organization. Doug, as you well know, because you had some of these assignments um, post 9-11, the agency really swung um, much more uh, heavily towards uh, combat support and some of these covert action operations that you described. Um, do you think that our um, global strategic espionage um, suffered as a result of that? I, I think it's impossible for it not to have suffered from the result. Certainly that was a key mission and support to the warfighter as we're fighting wars at that time after 9-11 and shortly thereafter in both Afghanistan and Iraq is a key agency component and they should certainly be collecting intelligence to support the warfighter. But the agency involved, uh, involved itself very much with being part of that. Uh, it grew a, a great number of paramilitary capabilities. It's uh, paramilitary ranks in SAC. SAD at the time, the um, Special Activities Division, grew immensely. And with that growth, so came the resources to the agency in terms of intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance platforms to conduct both collection, but also uh, enable kinetic operations and kinetic operations that were being conducted by our paramilitary cadre. Becoming a part of that in order to serve, which was ideally a unique complement to the military, which wasn't always that way, really had a requirement that more focus, more resources, more attention had to go to that type of activity. In the meantime, I, I think the traditional work of working uh, what we now call great power competition, but our traditional rivals or adversaries, such as Russia and China, Iran, North Korea, and other adversaries, would tend to get uh, the short end of the stick in terms of resources. Now, you take that over 20 years, and if officers who have really focused themselves on paramilitary operations or uh, kinetic activities or targeting for fine, fix, and finish, these officers all tended to advance. And disproportionately, I think, to those who stayed in a more traditional FI realm, that means the complexion of the agency changes, the outlook of the agency changes. I think you told me years ago that every generation has an impact on the culture of the agency. Well, here you had not only a generational impact of people uh, who now we see the millennials and Gen Z, but who had a certain career focus. And that clearly then lent to where was the agency going to spend its time and its money? How could we justify our resources? And it was easy to justify on ISR platforms or standing up a new uh, unit under our paramilitary assist and, and advise uh, capabilities as we did in Afghanistan and Iraq. But that means there was less time nurturing the, the capabilities of traditional foreign intelligence collection or those officers and forcing a lot of those officers to find themselves part of that counterterrorism and covert action realm where they themselves sort of found themselves on a different career path than they might not have might have otherwise been. So I think we find ourselves now in 2021 where you can even look at the worldwide threat assessment in what the intelligence community sees as the greatest threats and certainly the existential threats. I think there's an acknowledgement now that terrorism was, was clearly a tremendous threat to the United States and a significant one and an emotional one, 
but never an existential threat. Uh, it's not like Russian or Chinese nuclear missiles or North Korean nuclear missiles for that part. And now as we try to recalibrate or realign, there's going to be challenges because I can't help but imagine there'll be resistance from those officers and cadres that really advanced by virtue of what the agency became for 20 years. And they're now very much in a position of making those decisions of how we realign. So they may have a different perspective. Um, they may have a certain bias of themselves. And they also might lack some of the experience that traditionally agency case officers anyhow got from sort of refining their trade over years in, in multiple different locations and exercising the arts. So I think it's going to be doable. I, I think it has to start with good leadership and determination to, in fact, realign the agency to where it serves most importantly the current mission. Well, taking the long view, I can tell you that what um, goes around comes around. Um, you may know that I EOD in January of 1971. So this is the 50th year anniversary for my CT class. And we were a small class, only about 25 people. But when we got ready to um, go to the long ops course, uh, an additional 25 people were added to our class for the ops course. And those additional 25 people were all paramilitary officers from Southeast Asia who had served the agency and the nation very, very well in places like Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia, but were not full purpose uh, case officers yet. And a determination was made at that time as the Vietnam War was starting to wind down that we needed to get back to a global approach and we needed to cross train more people as regular Cat B case officers. So maybe we're at another um, juncture in our history where we're going to find ourselves um, retooling and redirecting. I, I, I think the parallel is, is an excellent one to make. And, and, and certainly uh, there's a lot of similarities. I think what worried me uh, and what I try to infuse in my book, and, and of course I didn't experience that time, um, and I didn't experience what happened in the 70s with the you know October 31st of Halloween nightmare and 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 all that followed politically but i i would ask you if if that sort of more paramilitary perspective permeated throughout the ranks at the agency at that time in the late 70s as it was going through its its own transition i think the the scope of the war effort what it as it was and and one can really take a look at cia casualties which you know, in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, rival that which was suffered by our paramilitary officers in Vietnam in the 60s and 70s. Uh, if it's if the culture has been damaged to a point where it's going to be harder to make that recalibration, if we neglected a broad cadre of our foreign intelligence collectors who would be leading that recalibration, and if in fact we have put ourselves in a position where the career occupational specialties are such uh, with the growth of targeting and, and targeters focused really being on geolocational intelligence as opposed to assessment and coming up with a package to identify a lead and, and an organization you hope to, to penetrate and, and how you might facilitate the case officer. It's those aspects of the, the contemporary challenges that worry me because I think at, at the time, uh, at least the agency I came into in the 80s, which wasn't then long after that, and of course I came in into any division, uh, any, uh, any in South Asia, the vaunted any, as you correctly say, where it was just a devotion to spy. Everybody in that division were all about recruit agents to collect intelligence. And even technical operations, as tends to be the case, were often enabled by agents you recruited to get you in to actually allow for a technical capability. There's been such reliance on force, on kinetic power and tools, which I will acknowledge the agency has refined to tremendous expertise, where sometimes it was tactics that drove strategy as opposed to the other way around, leaving now a, a group of, of mid to senior level officers that's all they've ever known. That's that's how they advanced their careers. And I just wonder and worry if it will be, and I'm not saying it was easy to transition from the 70s, but if there will be more challenges in transitioning today's CIA, and particularly today's clandestine service, uh, 
with the way it has changed its complexion to what the agency needs to do. And again, I remain an optimist. I, I, I believe in the agency, I believe in the mission, and I believe in our people. We, we really do have the most phenomenal people in, in the world. But there's got to be sort of an allowance upon leadership that we're going to have a few bumps. Um, I think some people will need to part ways with the agency if they can't make that adjustment, and that's always difficult to do. So there's going to be uh, some risk that leadership will have to take. And how do you transition the agency? And if we say back, and, and I don't even know if everybody would agree that or going back to what we were, how do you transition the agency to a, a less kinetic role, a role that relies more on finesse and stealth, which I think we prided ourselves in, and move away from, you know, technical capabilities or or otherwise kinetic force. So it might be difficult. I think Ambassador Burns and, and Mr. Cohen have the work set out for them. But to date, I've been reasonably pleased, at least what I see superficially on the outside, by the steps they've taken. Right, let's uh, shift gears a little bit. You say in your book that, um, in your experience, the agency has struggled uh, both with diversity and racism. Can you share with our viewers a little bit what your experience was in that area? Well, I had personal experience in the 80s, particularly, and, and somewhat into the 90s when I, when I came back in. Um, the agency, at least the clandestine service, was, as, as you know, uh, one of my children once said, going to an opera at the Kennedy Center, a sea of white in terms of those who really reflected the workforce. Um, they then, and I think even to an extent today, came from a profile of what the agency was looking, at least particularly from a, a case officer point of view, that had um, similar backgrounds, characteristics, and traits to, I would imagine the agency looked at successful case officers since its inception. These were largely folks that were, you know, well-educated, came from the best schools across the United States. Of course, the whole East Coast establishment in the early days of the agency and, and following the OSS, but the West Coast as well. And, and people who, like yourself, had grown up overseas and traveled based on your families, who brought tremendous experience and tremendous skills into the agency in terms of language and culture and, and history. But what I, I think the agency didn't allow for were um, taking advantage of the demographics of the United States, which reflects the world in terms of folks from different ethnicities, uh, religions, naturalized Americans who, granted, have a harder time getting through what is a very difficult and exhaustive security clearance process. So tended to recruit the same kinds of people. And... And I found even being Jewish at the time, I was uh, unique in the DO, at least, and particularly in, in any division. And it was um, particularly in the 80s and, and for, uh, you know, any was at war. You know, we had had uh, the, the bombing of the embassy in Beirut in April of 1983, where we lost a good number of our beloved colleagues. We had the uh, Marine Barracks bombing in October of 83. We had the numerous hijackings. And we had a very robust Arab-Israeli conflict still. Sometimes it would get hot and sometimes not. But of course, our whole presence in Beirut, uh, or at least in 1982 and 83, was because of the Arab-Israeli conflict. And I was surprised at the time, because I was fairly open about being Jewish, um, that officers, particularly in any division, were a little suspicious of me. Um, and, and even those who weren't suspicious of me just thought, well, you know, I wouldn't necessarily be competitive in any division because, after all, I was Jewish and I would have some bias and, and looked at me in terms of a very ethnic sort of sort of mindset, which I kind of I found surprising even at the time uh, for uh, a service which prides itself on its ability to deal with different cultures and embrace different cultures and such like that. And I found that was resident in some of the senior officers over the years in the 80s and even into the 90s and certainly had some impact on advancement for some, uh, opportunities for others. And that even then, even past 9-11, we weren't really doing a good a job as we should have in bringing in people of color, people of different ethnic groups, or even women uh, in, in past 9-11 and giving them opportunities and responsibilities because I think the agency had looked classically for what its image of the collector was. 
And as you know, we can operate anywhere. In any case, also can operate anywhere. But it's going to be a lot harder for someone of my complexion to uh, operate in Libya, even with the best Arabic, or in Uganda, even with the best local language, as, as people who could reflect where we want to send them and also bring with them insights into those cultures. Arab Americans didn't really particularly fare well either in the clandestine service for a number of years. They've, they've done better since. I, I think if you look at the agency now, uh, and, and you know, I left the hallways only two years ago, but uh, the younger generation certainly was more reflective, I think, of society. People of color, people of different ethnic groups, and the agency has made a concerted effort to reach out to them. Not necessarily always maybe in the best ways, because we still kind of are relying on folks longer in the tooth to go into communities where they're not a natural fit, perhaps. But certainly the, the senior generations, and I think some of the studies have shown, have not necessarily promoted um, minorities or other ethnic groups at the same levels as they've um, promoted white white males, uh, actually, uh, more than anything. But of course, there's been a concerted effort to also provide opportunities to female officers, and that's all gotten better. So I, I, I think that the agency has to relook really at how it assesses a potential collector or any member of the clandestine service. But I found as a case officer, um, what served me best was having grown up in, in difficult and challenging situations and overcoming adversity, where we may not necessarily need to look at um, Boston University and University of Michigan, but maybe we start looking at community colleges, where people who are a lot more street savvy um, and have skills that will uh, empower them to deal with, as we like to say in the DO, the fluid and dynamic circumstances for which case officers will face, for which there's no book. I think one of the amazing differences between being a CIA case officer and being an infantry commander or an FBI special agent uh, is there's a rule book for all these other things. You know, here's what you do if you encounter an ambush or here's how you prosecute this kind of offense. For case officers, you never you can't prepare for each and every scenario because it's about human beings and circumstances on the street. And I think finding people who are able to exercise good judgment, think on their feet, who've dealt with adversities, and, and believe me, people who are part of ethnic groups or people of color who've dealt with racism and prejudice and such like that are probably going to be more capable of dealing with, you know, a sudden crisis on the streets of Baghdad or Damascus. And of course, I'm very any centric here, but Moscow per se, than someone who grew up a very privileged, comfortable life in a very suburban world, which I think through until almost the end of my career was basically the the profile for most of our case officers. And as you well know, um, it was my privilege to serve as the chief of the Near East and South Asia Division for a time in the late 90s and early 2000s. And one of the things that I always liked to do was to meet the new career trainees who had just entered the Near East and South Asia Division and spend at least a half an hour with them. And what I would ask each one of them to do was tell me your story. How did you get here? And even, you know, 20 odd years ago, the stories were amazing. Um, and I think already even back then, we were starting to make some progress, not nearly as much progress has been made um, since then or needed to be made. I heard some very different, very diverse stories of people because there was no one uh, right answer. There were lots of different paths that people could take um, to find themselves basically to my office. And I was delighted to hear every one of those stories. And I had a tremendous um, impact. I, I remember you taking trainees to lunch. I would often be jealous. I was one of your group chiefs. You never took me to lunch, but you would, you would <laughs> take the trainees to lunch. Uh, and I think that was a tremendous uh, outreach. And I think it really had an impact on that generation. So I get the heart of your book. You tell a number of stories about recruiting and handling agents. What is it you'd like to um, convey to our audience about those experiences? You know, the perception of espionage is very much driven, I guess, uh, in the world or in America by movies, um, by um, fictional books and such like that. There's uh, beliefs that, well, you know, spies, and I consider myself in a good way among those, are going to blackmail people, use coercion, um, or alternatively, that the only people that are going to be willing to work, let's say, for the United States or likewise for Russia or any of adversaries are people who believe in that ideology. 
And and as you well know, and, and as our colleagues know, it's it's all about the human dynamic. It's about the human relationships. Um, we don't coerce people, uh, not necessarily because we're really great ethical people all the time, but because it just doesn't work. Because uh, if we've got to stand behind the intelligence of, of an agent that we've recruited and assess what the reliability is, can we depend on them, what's their own agenda, you can't do that for somebody who you're, you're blackmailing. Also, I wouldn't be terribly comfortable in the streets of Beirut in the middle of the night meeting an agent uh, on whose uh, I can depend on their for my security as well, who I've, I've blackmailed. Uh, likewise, you know, I, as you have no doubt as well, recruited agents who don't necessarily align with uh, what the United States stands for, but can trust the United States and particularly the CIA because they have some precipitating crisis, you know. They've got a child with leukemia. They've been, uh, they've got an axe to grind at their office, and they can not necessarily agree with what the United States represents, um, but believe that the United States and CIA and their case officer can be trusted. So, the importance of the human dynamic between the case officer and the agent, I think, is just something that's never been given sufficient attention or understanding. And how complicated that is and, and what an art that is in, in getting individuals who are often from two completely different worlds who might not naturally be friends for any other reason to a point where the case officer becomes almost like the priest in a confessional or the imam or, or a rabbi, where it's a place where the, the agent has come to depend on the case officer based on all the work the case officer does, which includes a great deal of manipulation, let's be fair, manipulating motivations, manipulating beliefs and ideology, and getting to a point where the case officer is seen as, as being in a non-judgment zone, where that's the one place the agent can tell all, can tell about his or her affairs or whatever ills or transgressions they've had because they know they won't be judged and they'll be valued for what they do and what they contribute. I think the profound, and, and, and I keep beating this horse hard, the depth of that is really hard to see from the outside and certainly not carried on by, by movies where someone just shows up someplace with a bag of money or with, with you know, you know, embarrassing photographs and boom, you've got an agent. It's complex. It takes time and it takes patience. And, and I believe the CIA has always done that extremely well. But again, that's what I worried about occurred in the evolution after 9-11, where we got away from that. Everything had to be quick. There had to be metrics. We had to have immediate gratification and satisfaction. And, and recruiting a Russian or an Egyptian uh, takes time and takes patience and also has to allow for things to go badly. Not every one of these operations is going to succeed. And I think some of the drivers that I saw in the last 20 years where we couldn't afford a mistake that was embarrassing, something that would be politically embarrassing, let alone. And we couldn't take the time and we needed to show numbers, you know, for number of successful kinetic operations with the video that went along with it, as opposed to the long, patient, methodical, and amazing work that's based on human dynamics that occurs in, in the field of human intelligence. So that's what I hope my stories would convey, because you deal with all different types of people. I mean, we've dealt with people who had not only blood on their hands, but sometimes American blood on their hands. And we had to find a way to connect with these people. Those of American blood were clearly those we couldn't prosecute or ex extradite, right? Otherwise we might have. But we also relied on people who weren't necessarily the most um, kind and benevolent human beings because they're not always the ones who are going to strike out against their own organization, their own government, their own family at times, and how to cultivate a human connection with someone like that, um, who's not exactly somebody you'd want to, to marry your sister or your daughter or your brother, and turn them into a reliable agent, and, and an appreciation of the risk they take, despite what their motivation is. If it's altruistic and ideological, that's wonderful, and isn't that easier? But if it's revenge, or if it's greed, um, then still finding a way to turn that dynamic into a relationship of trust because they don't have to like us. They do have to trust us for us to be able to guide those cases and the obligation we have to these agents. For the most part, a lot of these agents who take the greatest risk 
uh, risk not only themselves and their own lives, but their families. They're never going to see the shores of the United States. They're never going to be known in America, and yet they take these risks anyway. So the obligation we have to them, which I've found weakened over the 20 years post 9-11, where they seemed, uh, particularly to some in the intelligence community, more dispensable, less important. Uh, President Trump himself had no respect for human intelligence because he thought these were all traitors and they were blackmailed anyway. So why should we care about them? Why should we believe them? Is, is, is really to our peril if we, if we take that. And I'm hoping that sense, that appreciation for human intelligence, for the art, for the case officer, for the relationship, and for the agent themselves comes back to take to its right place in, in how much attention and how much we, we maintain our obligation to these people. Doug, in your book, um, you're fairly critical of the CIA. What uh, impression do you want to leave our viewers with about the CIA and its contribution, and particularly its contribution into the future? Well, I've already seen reflections that uh, the narrative from those um, about my book or about what I'm doing as being, well, it's sour grapes. Um, you know, he didn't make it to the top ranks. Uh, this is not about, you know, what the agency has done or is doing. Uh, I, I, I expected that, and, and I'm seeing reflections of that now. Um, the, the bottom line is I loved my career. I, I loved what I did, I, my colleagues, uh, and the organization. I, I, having seen some of the most mind-boggling circumstances and threats to the United States derail things that are nightmarish in proportion that, thank God, the American public will not need to know about because of the clandestine work of the, the people of the agency risking themselves and their lives day in and day out to be sort of the hidden first line of defense. And like I say, sometimes the best and last line of defense against the most horrific threats. My book was written to promote what the agency is and should be doing. It was a criticism of leaders who I saw taking the agency away from that mission, changing its culture and compromising its ethics in the process and its integrity and its credibility with the American people. CIA has a unique relationship with the public. It's a secret organization operating for an open society. So it's required to shield a lot of its secrets and sources and methods, but it shouldn't hide behind them to deflect accountability. And, and I saw this circling of the wagons mentality among the top ranks of the agency over 9-11, Iraq, coast, which really hit home uh, in terms of who suffered the consequences with those who lost their lives or the American people in terms of losing their security? So my criticism of the organization is not about its mission. It's not about the people, the rank and file. It's about those folks who, over a course of 20 years, really put themselves in a position to serve their own career interests at the expense of the agency at the expense of our relationship with, with the public, and very much at the expense of our capabilities as an elite spy service. So in some ways, I, I hope readers, as they go through the anecdotes I tell, all of which are meant to make a point at the end about how things have changed, not always for the better, but in some ways I found it was, for me, a love letter to the agency for letting me have this amazing life where I met the most amazing people I was able to be part of history at times, and I paid, played at least some contribution in saving lives over the years, which, without which the United States would be in, in a very sorry situation. So my hope uh, is that it will promote a discussion and a conversation among those who realize we need the agency to do what it does best. Uh, get out of the policy business. Uh, don't grade its own homework. Don't become part of policy. Focus on spying, on foreign intelligence, analysis, and covert action that makes smart. Covert action that we do because there's no other agency in the United States government that can do it. That's when the CIA should do covert action, whether it's kinetic, whether it's covert influence, sabotage, whatever it may be. It should be clearly a need for U.S. security, and clearly the CIA is doing it because no one else can. It shouldn't be the easy button. 
for complex and troubling political considerations that, that our leadership might face. The book is entitled The Recruiter. It comes out later this month. I urge you all to take a look. And I'd like to thank Doug for coming on AFIO now and giving us a very, very thought-provoking uh, presentation. Thank you, Jim. It's, it's been a pleasure.